We are now live with the webinar, Unpacking the Digital Services Act. Does the new EU digital rulebook address online hate and anti-Semitism? Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Alina Brickman. I'm the Director of EU Affairs at Neighbourhood International. And together with my colleague Ilan, we'll be moderating today's very timely discussion. Um, we'll be looking to unpack the recently published Digital Services Act, the European Commission's new digital um, rule book. The digital space has been increasingly center stage with all our attention directed online during the pandemic and issues that were already demanding our attention, such as disinformation, conspiracies, extremism and hate online have become, as we're all painfully aware, truly urgent. For Jewish communities, the COVID crisis also brought about unprecedented new um, waves of conspiracy theories of hate, and um, there were infinitely creative and sinister variants um, of stories that placed Jews at the center of the pandemic. And so particularly in this increasingly worrying context, the proposal for a new digital legislation could not have been um, coming about sooner. For us at Neighbourhood International, this has been an important point of focus as we've worked alongside fellow Jewish advocacy organizations to articulate policy recommendations around tackling anti-Semitism and hate online, both for the Digital Services Act and of course beyond it. Um, and you're welcome to check out deleteantisemitism.org to see some of that work. Um, to what extent these policy recommendations are actually reflected in the Digital Services Act, we'll discuss with our panelists today who will help us digest this document and provide additional insight into what it will actually mean in practice. So that said, I'll pass over to Ilan, our European Affairs Officer, to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Alina. Hello, everyone watching, and welcome also from my side. As Alina mentioned, I have the real pleasure today of introducing our, our panelists. So today we are delighted to be joined by Paul F. Nemitz, Principal Advisor in the Directorate General for Justice and Consumers of the European Commission DG Just. Prior to this role, Mr. Nemitz was the director responsible for fundamental rights and union citizenship, the lead director for the reform of the EU data protection legislation, the Snowden follow-up, the negotiations of the EU-US privacy shield, and the EU code of conduct against hate speech on the internet. Thank you for joining us today, Paul. And we're also- My very pleasure, pleased. thank you. Thank you, Paul. And we're also very pleased to have Suzette Bronkhurst with us today, Deputy Director and First Secretary of INAH, the International Network Against Cyber Hate, an organization which she founded, co-founded rather in 2002, now boasting 27 members in over 20 countries. Suzette has 30 years experience of working within the field of anti-discrimination. And so thanks for joining us today also, Suzette. One final Welcome. note. Thank you. And one final note from, from me before we make a start on the discussion. Uh, I would just really encourage everyone watching both on Zoom and on Facebook to ask your questions on the Q&A function and in the comment section respectively. And should we have time, we'll put your questions to our panelists. And so without further ado, Paul, I'd like to start with you. The, the online space, as Alina was mentioning, has been receiving increasing scrutiny in recent times and the need to articulate more clearly its guiding rules has become evident. President von der Leyen has committed to a human-centered approach to digital govern governance, for example. If you could therefore tell us in a nutshell the relevant background to this conversation, sort of what were the, the needs and what have been the goals in articulating a new digital rulebook? Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ilan and uh, Elina, for the invitation and for the possibility to discuss here today. Um, I will uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, the digital um, uh, strategy of the Commission, but also about how the Commission uh, wants to strengthen uh, democracy uh, in Europe. These things have to be seen uh, and are seen uh, together by the Commission and uh, all the services of the Commission also work together um, uh, on, on these very important challenges, the importance of which has been, of course, 
dramatized and 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 that's really a wake up call uh, uh, the storming uh, um, of of the capital in, in the us and we have seen this also before uh, in europe um, uh, also in uh, some member states including the one which i know best uh, people tried to storm um, let's say the key institution um, of democracy so this is um, very important and this is also already um, the context in which we have to read um, uh, the proposal for the digital services act the commission uh, has quite a number of um, uh, initiatives um, uh, going forward, um, um, which are, let's say, pulled together in the democracy um, action plan on the one hand and the digital strategy uh, on the other. And, and let me just recall um, that um, we already have in place uh, a code of conduct against hate speech and xenophobia on the internet, um, the reporting about which has inspired in part uh, the work on the uh, DSA um, and the DSA partially puts um, um, into a binding uh, law what um, is in the uh, code of conduct, uh, let's say only uh, a voluntary commitment of the companies. Um, we have um, um, uh, in the planning an uh, initiative to make um, the framework um, directive on xenophobia and hate speech a euro crime, thus to make enforcement of this easier. And also we are pulling the screw on uh, with um, uh, infringement actions against member states who haven't implemented this uh, framework directive. Um, and um, uh, we are working on an anti-Semitism strategy under Vice President Schinas and Katharina von Schnurbein, the uh, coordinator uh, for uh, working with the Jewish communities in Europe, which will come out next year. So what I would like to pass on as a basic message is uh, the finding of the great uh, historian from Tel Aviv University, uh, Walter Grapp, um, who uh, uh, often wrote about uh, the relationship between democracies, uh, democratization um, and uh, Jewish emancipation, and and he basically made it very clear uh, that it is best for for the for the Jewish communities, and not only for them, but that there's a very clear relationship between a good life uh, for Jews and and democracy. And that's why I think it's great that we have this kind of discussion. And I think it's also great and very very important that the Jewish communities um, engage and bring others along to engage in democracy, because. This is what um, the, um, the Digital um, Services Act and also the Digital Market Act and uh, a few other acts which relate to the digital, which are all part of the digital strategy of the Commission, is now about. We are writing the rule book for the future of democracy and fundamental rights in the digital age. And this is nothing which can be left to technicians. This is nothing which can be left only to economics ministries. This is at the core of social uh, societal policy, and it is at, at the core of democracy policy and fundamental rights policy. And that's why it's very, very important that uh, everybody engages and that the civil society is broadly engaging here, not only those who are, um, let's say, whose profession it is or who are mainly interested in digital rights, but also people who are not users and, 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 and organizations which represent others than the so-called users are very, very important here because what is happening here and these rules will affect all of us. They are key for the good functioning of our democracy, for the good discourse, the way we um, have possibility to discuss together and come to decisions in, uh, in democratic procedures and let's say the society societal climate. And this is what brings me now uh, to, um, um, let's say, the more uh, detailed analysis of the Digital Services Act as regards the possibilities to fight anti-Semitism. Let me be very clear uh, from the outset. The proposal does not criminalize any type of behavior um, in a new way, uh, which is not criminalized in member states, but it is very clear that it will make the action against criminal behavior more efficient, in particular in two respects. First, um, the platforms will have a, a duty to report potential criminal behavior to the authorities. Second, um, um, they will uh, have an obligation uh, to take down when asked um, by uh, authorities of member states, 
content without further scrutiny. The scrutiny comes afterwards. I think uh, this is important. But of course, we have to recognize also that uh, much of anti-Semitism which we find today is not actually criminalized in member states' law. So this brings me to the second level of analysis, namely, what does the DSA bring in terms of increased ability to take action against anti-Semitism, which is not criminalized and which doesn't fall under criminal law. And here, um, there are again a number of key innovations. In the law as it stands today, on both sides of the Atlantic, by the way, um, the big platforms are reticent to do own initiative investigations and search proactively for a content which does not comply with their community rules, such as uh, anti-Semitic content, where it is outruled by community rules. Why? Because if they do this active search um, and therefore obtain knowledge of such content, um, they have um, a, a liability to face um, um, under um, the e-commerce directive and also under Article 230 of the um, Indecent Communication Act in the United States. And the one key innovation of the DSA is that it makes very clear that where companies do on their own initiative um, activities to, to, let's say, police the content of their website, they will not fall into this liability trap anymore in the future. So this is, this is very, very important because this means there is no excuse anymore to say, sorry, we can't take this liability um, um, if companies, uh, if platforms, uh, big or small, this, this is an obligation for all uh, platforms, if platforms have um, uh, content of anti-Semitic nature, um, then uh, let's say from a uh, civil society point of view, you can hold them uh, accountable and they cannot say, which they could say until now, we are not going to take action here proactively because that would expose us to a liability. I think this is um, a very important step forward. And now coming um, to uh, the big uh, platforms. The big platforms have what I would call a structural uh, obligation uh, uh, in addition. They have to do a risk assessment um, relating to content, which uh, uh, may be of discriminatory nature, content um, which uh, puts uh, uh, in a, um, a groups, which 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 goes after um, uh, uh, groups uh, in a way which is, uh, uh, let's say, not uh, um, something we can uh, respect in in democratic societies. And they once they find that such content. Uh, is very often uh, on their website, they have to take structural mitigating measures for this. Um, and if they don't do this, uh, they, they um, can be fined. By the way, I mean, the obligations under the DSA will be subject to fines. Um, and I think this is also an important um, step forward. Now, I do believe that um, some of these provisions um, can be used, um, in particular, uh, the provision um, on, um, um, on uh, the in intentional abuse of the service um, and uh, the provision on um, uh, content which is of discriminatory nature, uh, which can be, these can be used um, if, to work, uh, let's say, against uh, certain types um, of anti-Semitism. And um, uh, of course, only, of course, um, only for um, the, the smaller platforms, because these obligations only come for the very big platforms. For smaller platforms, the key thing will be, and this will be my last sentence for the introduction, to get them to, intru to introduce into the terms of service, I think this would be a great step forward, um, the definition of anti-Semitism as it has been adopted the internet. Holocaust. 
Remembrance Alliance. I think this should now, I think as a precedent for the next, the United States have already um, signed up to this as much as uh, the Commission and also um, in the Council, I think one can say after the resolutions of last year, that, that this is, let's say, a common position. And I would find it absolutely um, normal uh, that the companies um, also sign up, um, you know, to make this their working tool to keep their um, uh, um, uh, platforms free of uh, anti-Semitism. And, and once they have done this combined with the um, Digital Service Act, um, I think uh, we have good new instruments in place. And I say now, in theory, because what now starts is, of course, the big game of um, lobbying, and we will see some very dirty lobbying. And I think it is very important, uh, like on GDPR before, that those who want, uh, you know, good fundamental rights protection, good data protection, those who want good protection against uh, uh, anti-Semitism and other forms of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, speech which should not be respected um, um, on these platforms, they have to engage now so, so that the act in the end finds the right balance which i would say stands in the good european tradition to put some rules on speech after all because this is a good european tradition this is not a bad tradition we don't need lessons from america uh, to tell us that we are not as good in free speech as america is the reality is in terms of the indexes of freedom of journalism and freedom of speech european countries are regularly uh, um, in, uh, before the United States. And, um, and I think we have to withstand, uh, you know, this very tump uh, lobbying um, against uh, these new rules. And we have to, let's say, work uh, on um, writing into the future of own European tradition of putting down rules for platforms. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul, for these initial remarks. First of all, for kind of contextualizing the whole conversation into this broader picture of um, the health of our democracy at the end of the day. But also, we already got a little bit into the meat of the conversation, and you um, already touched on a few points that surely we will return to um, illegal speech versus harmful but legal speech, and some of the tools that the DSA provides in this direction this distinction about regulations imposed on big platforms versus smaller platforms. And I think very importantly, your note about the IRA definition as a standard for platforms is really well taken. Um, Suzette, let me bring you in at this point. Um, you know, Ina is focused on really making the internet a safer and more human-centered place. Um, your federating organizations that are dealing with this very topic. And I'm sure the DSA was not only a point of interest, but also a point of hope. So I'd be curious in your perspective, what were the main regulatory gaps? What were the things that you hope the DSA would address? Um, what, are, what were some of the central issues for you? And then we'll see whether uh, that actually came, came to be. Um. For me, uh, by the way, I've been working on against hate on the internet since 1996. Some of you weren't born then yet. Uh, in my experience, there's the DSA is fatally flawed, not by its good intentions, but in real life, uh, 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 the EU doesn't manage to have their own member states stick to human rights. Uh, uh, gay free cities in Poland, uh, in Hungary, you have all sorts of trouble, Jews and Roma getting hunted down. And what does the EC do? Nothing. So I don't see how they would actually enforce this new law, which I must admit, I looked on the web up and down. The only thing I could find was a, was a suggestion of the document, to find the document. That's 130 pages. 
And then uh, the only points that came out is what is happening now already. Uh, I didn't see the difference because I didn't go into the document. And I'm convinced you can't get people to stick to the rules by and large because you depend on the users at large to stick to them. Because there's no way, how many million people do you want to put online to check if everybody stays within the rules? So that's a problem. B, with big platforms, they have no trouble at all. They're, they're not a charitable institution. Eh? They're not about democracy, they're about making money. When Trump was kicked off Twitter and Facebook, they made huge losses. So the reason they keep them on as long as possible until it really goes too far is to make to attract more visitors and to make more money with advertising. So uh, there's no way they're going to stick to any kind of agreement unless they're really forced to with hefty fines. I know that uh, Mark Zuckerberg shit his pants when Germany came out with a law with hefty, hefty fines. Um, and, and the thing is, uh, us older folks still talk about in real life versus uh, cyber life, that distinction is not there anymore. You know, uh, anybody from around 20 or before 30, internet is their life to a huge amount, uh, 50%. So the distinction falls away. They just have a bigger bigger bullhorn to blow their shit on the net. Um, and it, it's uh, an extremely complicated um, problem because you simply don't have enough eyes to check it out, everybody. So. I think the way it should go is to make a document and publish that widely that addresses the users and talks to them about their behavior and what is the other side of their behavior. Words don't hurt, no. Um, Auschwitz wasn't built by bricks, but by words. So yeah, I'm a bit somber, but hey, that's me. Maybe it will work this time, but I think it's also very important that all the member states explicitly sign this and stick to it themselves. Because uh, for now, fundamental rights differ from EU country to EU country. So, you know, uh, uh, in a lot of the Eastern states, they don't find discrimination or hate speech against Roma a problem, really, because it's all true, ain't it? So that's the first thing you have to address. Actually, yeah, it's from top down, in a way. First, you have to convince all the countries to stick to it. And then you have to put it in a form that ordinary users, that are the main culprits, in a way, since the platforms have many ways of diverting attention. Um, so you have to make it clear to users that it's just unethical. In the 80s, politicians and everybody uh, liked to jump on the anti-racism bandwagon. Since the 90s, that's not happening anyway. People uh, feel afraid or they feel it's not proper to um, stand for anti-racism or you know, to combat it. So I, I, in a way, we have to address the leadership first, but then the users, because the only way it will get better if, by and large, users go along with behaving decently. Thank you, Suzette, for your for your impassioned remarks there. Um, and perhaps if I can stick with you for for a moment, Suzette, you mentioned how you talked um, to. The, the, the DSA package as a whole perhaps could have more effect by imposing fines uh, was one of the comments you made and as well that EU member states um, sign up to it on a on sort of an individual basis. Um, if you could go into 
sort of, would there be any other areas that you think the, the DSA should be addressing that should be a high priority for you? And um, yeah, what more had you hoped from the, from the I, DSA? I would hope that uh, the DSA would make some kind of trans-European rule book that every country, individual country, has to stick to. Because now our problem with removal of illegal content um, is that if you go to Poland, something else is illegal than if you go to Germany. Uh, so every country has their own set of rules. And so they interpret the DSA in their own way. Uh, and then you have harmful content, of course, which is, yeah, you just have to address the platforms for that. Because platforms, because they're American-based, um, can remove whatever they like because they're a private company. And private companies can have whatever client they want and they can refuse whatever client they have uh, without getting sued and having to pay money. So somehow we've been trying to chip away and the prime example is uh, Facebook and Holocaust denial. It took us about, I think, 12 years to get them to not accept Holocaust denial anymore. Because before they said, well, it's just alternative history. Could have happened like that. So I, I but most of all, I wish the DSA would be more clear in less than 130 pages. Thank you, Suzette. And indeed, it's a very stuffy document. So we're lucky to, to have you uh, to discuss it in a, you know, in a conversation rather than skimming through the document. Um, I think this question of harmonization is, is indeed very important. And the fact that hate speech may be dealt in the future um, as a euro crime, I think is a good step in that direction. So I propose that we now look at some um, of the concrete issues that Paul alluded to, to in the beginning. Um, so Paul, perhaps on the question of harmful but legal content, this is an area where we were hoping we would see more action. You noted a few points that um, are relevant, um, but um, our perspective was that certainly the DSA does a thorough job of dealing with illegal content. I think it lays out very clearly what should happen next on this front and what platforms responsibilities are. But with regard to legal but degrading and offensive and deeply harmful content, um, which is at the end of the day, the vast majority of problematic content online, we were uh, we were left in a bit of a bind. So perhaps you can detail a little bit more what the steps you mentioned in the beginning will actually will actually mean in practice. And while I think they are um, important steps forward, what do you think could have been done more in this area? And perhaps these are things that can be pushed for now in the Parliament and Council discussions. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm I'm going to I, I think what uh, Suzette is saying um, are, are very important points, and and we have to take them uh, extremely uh, serious. So let let me um, pick up uh, some of these points. I think um, the concern that uh, fundamental rights are not equally defended uh, in 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 the member states as is the rule of law uh, not equally defended, and one could also have this discussion of democracy, is becoming increasingly an issue for Europe as a whole. Uh, the old debates in the past were about more democracy in Europe, more fundamental rights when the EU is acting. Today's debate is about the democracy in member states and the respect for fundamental rights in the European member states of the union so so really the focus of attention has shifted and it is true that the european union historically in this areas uh, in all, in all these areas is weak because we started as an 
the European economic uh, community, we became a, a union of values uh, only much later. The um, Charter of Fundamental Rights is only um, uh, binding since 2009. So we are young in this area. But I think it is also fair to say uh, that uh, this commission has picked up this challenge um, um, and um, um, definitely um, you can see it uh, from the leadership of uh, President von der Leyen uh, uh, and you can see it in uh, you know, the actions like uh, the DSA and not only the DSA but also the Democracy Action Plan, the increased action on, on the rule of law. But of course, um, we are a community of law and we can only act within the law and the law sets limits to what we can do inside member states. But I would say the concerns which you have, Suzette, that we should be harmonizing more, we should be having more Europe, these are things which have to be taken into the political debate, into parliament, especially because now we start another round on the future of Europe. And I think it's a good time. It's a good time to bring these points in. That's the first point. The second point about enforcement of EU law uh, in these complex areas. I think uh, in the DSA proposal, you know, we are all learning um, all the time and there are already a number of steps forward, let's say learnings from the GDPR. So let me give you two examples of learnings uh, in the new proposal of the DSA, where you can clearly see that the Commission is a learning institution and we're trying to do things better. And I'm sure, you know, the debates in Parliament and in Council will further ameliorate these uh, things if there is a sufficient engagement of civil society on these points. First, as to the fines, the Commission here now proposes higher fines than in GDPR. And I think that it's justified. I mean, my personal view has always been there is no justification in law, we cannot explain it, why in competition law we protect the competition in the market with a maximum fine of 10% of global turnover, but when it comes to values, when it comes to fundamental rights and democracy, we don't dare to put 10%. We have to fiddle around, you know, 4% or 6%. Or so. It's ridiculous. I mean, how can we make this difference. I would say, you know, fines um, um, have to be 10%. Uh, that's my personal view. The Commission has decided here differently. It has gone higher than GDPR is, uh, which shows you also the importance the Commission um, allocates to this instrument. So that's, that's one point. The other point is on enforcement. The mechanism of enforcement of EU law um, is, of course, let's say, centrally the European Court of Justice with infringement procedures. But um, when it comes to enforcement towards companies, we, of course, need actors who do it. And we have learned uh, from GDPR that a completely decentralized enforcement, especially when dealing with these huge platforms, is not ideal. And of course, in EU law, we have other models of enforcement. We have not only the completely decentralized enforcement of GDPR, we also have the enforcement mechanism in competition law, where the decentral authorities in the member states, the competition authorities, they can enforce EU law, but if they're not getting their act together, and if they're not doing their job, the commission can take the case and enforce it. And here in the DSA, we have uh, let's say, uh, a middle road in the sense that um, if member states' authorities don't act, then the Commission becomes the enforcer against the big platforms. And I think that is important because uh, the big platforms have their seats um, in, uh, in Ireland in particular. Uh, Microsoft has its European seat in, uh, in, in Luxembourg. And, you know, there is a certain moral hazard of um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, you know, politics in these countries to select people as heads of the enforcement authorities, you know, who are not so proactive and so on. So um, it is important to have a mechanism which ensures that this enforcement actually takes place. And I think it's good if the commission is as a central authority and as an independent authority, uh, which is not uh, following any specific interests of certain member states, uh, can play a role here 
it's also a question of uh, power relations. You know, um, these platforms are active in all the member states and they are huge and the commission deals with them already in competition cases. So I think there is a good argument to be made that as at least as, as regards the big platforms, the commission has to play a strong role uh, in, uh, in enforcement here. So again, here we can see that um, a closer study of the proposal, it, it does actually address this very, very important concern, uh, Suzette, uh, which you raised, which is that um, completely decentralized enforcement has its limits. And the third element here is we're not proposing a directive. I think there the EU and not only the Commission, also the member states, everybody has learned that in this digital world where services are provided cross-border as a normality, having directives uh, really uh, makes things much more uh, complicated. Uh, also, it's not good for our own companies to scale in the European market. So we are proposing here a regulation. And now let me address the point, which is a very important one, on the harmonization of what is illegal content. This is not foreseen in this regulation. But what is foreseen in the regulation is that demands can be made cross-border um, to take down uh, content um, and and this amounts to, uh, let's say, halfway. Why? Um, the business model of, um, um, of these platforms is that they have, let's say, one front um, um, uh, towards, towards Europe. And if in some member states this matter is taken very serious, um, the result will be a, a betterment of the content of the platform in all the member states. Because, you know, nothing in this um, um, uh, DSA says that, you know, let's be very concrete now, that if there's anti-Semitism in Polish language, neither does it say that the request to take this down must come from Poland, nor does it say um, that uh, the request must be made in Polish language. No, if you have your network of NGOs, and if you have some people um, who work with you on this, uh, you can launch these requests from anywhere. And maybe even, you know, if there are certain member states where there is uh, something which is criminal, uh, criminalized, which is not criminalized in other member states, you can ask these member states, because this content is visible all over, of course, Europe, to also act on the basis of the criminal law. So I think um, there is potential here, and I hope, and I am ex at least also ready to work with civil society to make this effective, because I already see from your comments that um, it will also be a duty um, of the commission, not only to explain this to the citizens and, uh, and to the parliamentarians, of course, in the parliamentary process, but also to work with civil society to make these mechanisms, which, which give an enhanced role to civil societies as trust organizations, as trusted flaggers, uh, to make this really work. Um, and um, so maybe, maybe I stop here now, but, but let me say also one thing. We don't have the law yet. You can assume that there will be forces in the council and there will be lobbying going on to now start watering down these, um, um, uh, uh, these proposals. And I think, um, you know, Suzette, um, everything you say is right. And I think you have to keep on banging uh, away. And uh, I would wish also, um, you know, um, move on to uh, let's say, uh, make proposals of an operational nature, what you want in addition, exactly. Because in the same way that others will come and say, you know, this is too burdensome for us, too costly, we don't want this, we don't want that. Uh, you know, it's now important that the interested civil society also works on this. And I know it's complex, but at least I'm ready also to, to work with you and listen to you and help, uh, you know, finding, uh, um, um, you know, explaining to you the intricacies of, of this draft so that you are able to come up with proposals which serve public interest, which serve democracy and fundamental rights. And be assured, the Commission will always listen to you. And I'm sure there will be people also in the parliament and also in the council very interested in what proposals in terms of 
additional good ideas you have. I think everybody sees this now also as a joint travel and a joint learning exercise, and the process will be iterative. Well, thank you very much um, for this overview and particularly the points about illegal content being able to be reported from anywhere and taken action from, from across the EU, I think is particularly important. I do want to, to take you back to the question around harmful but legal content. And you mentioned in the beginning two steps. So the proactive investigation um, and the removal of a liability trap. So platforms are, if not encouraged, allowed to proactively take steps to, to find um, content that goes against their regulation. Is there more that could have been done? I'm thinking here of uh, points around data collection, analyzing um, how hate is traveling online and being able to, to have conclusions from there or such things. Are there are, were there points discussed on harmful content that just didn't come through that could have been could have been relevant? Oh, um, um, I only gave a summary of this, as Suzette also said. You know, 130 pages uh, document. There is, of course, more in it. Um, so let me be uh, a little bit more uh, uh, precise um, on uh, the duty to make a structural analysis of harmful content um, and to take measures to, um, to avoid uh, this as a structural problem. This, of course, requires as, a, exactly what you say. It requires um, an understanding of uh, and uh, a proactive analysis of the big platforms, what they have. And you know they have to invest themselves to understand why and how they are uh, uh, harboring anti-Semitic content. And they have to understand the impact of this and they have to take measures to mitigate this. So I think this is a requirement on the companies where you can insist and which is subject, if they don't do it properly, subject to fining. And this is not, uh, let's say, uh, something which has no teeth. In Germany, you can see uh, the German uh, authorities uh, have imposed a fine on Facebook for not uh, implementing properly the Nets DG, uh, and I'm sure uh, that uh, under the DSA, you know, this um, uh, this structural work will be looked at very closely. The assessment will be done uh, from uh, out from independent um, uh, outside uh, organization, and so uh, here the companies will be held to account. That is one avenue, but the other avenue, what you just said about the traveling uh, uh, on the internet and, and the uh, better understanding of the whole phenomenon. This is about science and civil society getting access to the data. And this is also something the DSA provides for. The DSA provides um, uh, an obligation to provide uh, data to scientists to be able to uh, follow up uh, on, on, on these issues. And um, so I think it does contain um, uh, quite a set of tools which, which can be made useful, provided, you know, uh, the lobbyist first tries to get out obligations. If they can't get out the obligations, and the lobby war will come. I mean, you have read all in the newspaper the plans of Google, you know, and so on. And then, of course, Google had, has excused and said, oh, we're not the bad guys. But, you know, let's see. I, I've been through it on GDPR. 100%. <laughs> so it will come. And the steps go like this. The first thing, and you can read this all in my book, unfortunately, only in German. The first step is get rid of the obligation. If they can't get rid of the obligation, the second step will be to make the obligation so complicated and to make the duties and the rights of others against them so inoperational that they don't have to worry about. So this point of complexity, which Suzette brings up, is very important because one technique of the lobby now will be to make it even more complex, to put in even more conditions, you know. And um, so there, uh, you know, I would say you have to get together, um, you know, to defend the good elements of the proposals and to be ready to go around in Parliament and to member states, uh, especially because unfortunately, I think it will, for many member states, it will be people from economics ministries who will be sitting in the council working group 
yeah, in the commission, it's DG Connect in the lead. So logically, uh, in the member states, it will often be people from economics ministries. You know, they need to be educated about your concerns. That's not their natural uh, habitat, so to say. And, um, and there, I think, you know, it is important to work with them on formulations and to make them understand why the formulation as proposed is good or why the formulation has to be changed in this or that way to make it even more operational so that they are able uh, also, let's say, you know, with your help to withstand the lobbying, which will go in the other direction. Thank you for your comments, Paul. Absolutely. Suzette, I'll come to you and both give you an, an opportunity to respond to, to Paul's comments on the potential for, for lobbying that will take place and to how perhaps civil society engaging on this issue can, can take a more, can, can respond to what Paul was saying and take on some, some operational recommendations to, to members in the parliament and, and the council. And as well to, to ask you on, on this issue of of harmful but legal content, had you, how do you think perhaps the DSA going forward to, to the stages in the Parliament and the Council can, can take on this issue? Um, you know, I'm all over in favour of Paul again. For a minute there I thought he went to the dark side, but he didn't. Um, <clears throat> there's also other, way, other ways to circumvent all this transparency that the big platforms have to give. It's called artificial intelligence. So I would suggest that the European Commission would put money in a company or a scientist to develop artificial intelligence because all the bad speech is public, viewable. So if you have somewhat uh, more advanced artificial intelligence, you can fish a lot out and then it takes people to judge it. With a harmful content, it's very difficult because anything that's not illegal, people find ways. Again, Germany is a shining example. Our co-founder of the network, Jugendschutz, protection of youth. And under the protection of youth falls, for instance, pornography, which is not necessarily illegal, but it is for young people. So there is um, hateful content that is harmful, in particular for youth, that is not illegal. But through the Youth Protection Act, you can still get at them. What we did in the olden days before the platforms became so ridiculously big was we went after individuals that were posting uh, on different websites or web fora. Um, another way of, of getting people to behave is you, if you go after them personally and they're traceable. In the, on the before the big platforms, uh, we could find 99.5% uh, of the perpetrators. And they went to court personally. And believe you me, those uh, keyboard warriors are scared. They wouldn't say it in the street because they're afraid to get hit by somebody. So that's another way, but it's a vast amount. The, our biggest problem, I think, is the amounts. And, and that's also what YouTube says, why they can't remove all the shit. Although if you put a music, uh, a copyrighted music, uh, while you're uploading your little clip, you get a warning from uh, Google that this is um, copyrighted uh, material, so please don't use it. Um, um, we're trying now to talk with the big players to get them to agree to, together with NGOs and scientists, work on an artificial intelligence system that makes it more possible to trace hateful content and also the spread over different countries. And um, about uh, anybody can, can report a hateful content that is in particularly true 
in France. France is of the opinion, whatever you can see while in France on the internet, no matter where it comes from or in what language it is, they can prosecute. But harmful content will always be difficult because it's a matter of opinion. And I think our best shot is to um, do what Germany did and make it under youth protection. Because we all know the tender children's soul, even though they have a smartphone at the age of 10. Suzette, thank you. Thank you for that. Actually, very interesting what you mentioned. Um, I was just speaking the other day to an initiative who is doing something very similar to what you're proposing, fishing harmful content from Twitter in particular through AI and then offering these comments for human reporting. So I think indeed there's space for a lot of innovation in the AI and area. Assessment. And Human Sorry? assessment. Uh, human assessment. We've exactly. uh, we brought out a, a report about COVID and hate speech, and this this is both in the title. So they threw it off, Facebook, because they use artificial intelligence because they have such massive amounts of data, and then not a person looks at it. Right. So if somebody mentions breastfeeding, they, the artificial intelligence sees breast and throws it out. So you have to have humans assess the fishing expedition you did. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot of messiness. And if humans aren't involved to refine these things, artificial intelligence doesn't yet have the collected intelligence to, to do a clear assessment in this um, marginal cases. But perhaps staying on this topic of algorithmic transparency, AI, and how decisions are being made, this is another big chunk um, of the conversation that we, we would like to, to tackle with you. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, the DSA now requests platforms to publish informations about algorithmic decisions only with regard to content that they are restricting. But what about content that they are promoting? Uh, we know very well that a um, huge part of this discussion around radicalization comes from the fact that platforms themselves are recommending increasingly extremist content to the, their users to keep them engaged. Is this being at all addressed or am I correct in saying that um, the transparency required is only with regard to content that is being restricted? Paul, I don't know if you can hear us. We we don't. I believe we don't see you at the moment. Yes, you're back, but are muted currently. I I I can guess uh, what your question is. So first of all, let me be give you my personal view. Um, we cannot trust the platforms involved they say about their technical capabilities. My, my experience is they lie. Um, so it, when we ask ourselves, for example, the question, are they, is there in artificial intelligence which can identify speech which is either illegal, maybe clearly evidently illegal, or as you said, the marginal cases, or which is not illegal but harmful, the technology is moving on and is getting better and better. And what the platforms are also not honest about is exactly as you now said, uh, their business model requires something like an upload filter. Why? In the moment, new content comes on the website. This content must be analyzed immediately as to its usefulness for placing advertisements in its context. And uh, this is how they make money. So they they make most money for their business of advertising, placing it in the context of what is on their website when they know best and quickest what is on their website. So uh, they have managed to create the impression 
that it would be a terrible demand to have upload content, uh, upload filters, and we have some very active lobbyists which get money from America running around and saying, no upload filters for the name of freedom, no upload filters, no upload filters. But the reality is these companies already have upload filters for their own commercial interests because these upload filters help them. Well, I wouldn't call them filters. These are content recognition systems which help them to understand what is there and where to place the advertisement in the context. And they are basically refusing to use this technology for public purpose. And in this context, they tell us, you know, cloud cuckoo land stories as if, oh, you know, this is impossible. It's technically impossible. We will hear this argument very, very often. And when we hear this argument, I think our initial instinct must be don't trust tech on what they're telling you about their technical capabilities and about their business model. We have read the books of Shoshana Zuboff about the culture of lying in Google and elsewhere. And you know this is all very well researched. So we have to equip ourselves with alternative knowledge for, on, on this. We need to talk to other tech companies. We need to talk to academia. Maybe we have to go you know, to Israel and talk to advanced tech companies there to understand what actually can be done in terms of content analysis. Um, um, and I think it is a very legitimate ask, Suzette, to say, you know, if the commission um, wants to help um, to get um, illegal and hateful speech and also legal but harmful speech of the internet and for this purpose has made um, a, a code of conduct and now is proposing the DSA, it should also through its different research programs uh, invest in AI which helps this purpose and which empowers civil society with tools to make this happen. I think it's a very legitimate request and I will certainly take it back, but you should also bang on this. Uh, you know, uh, the, the money uh, is in the uh, in the funds of the research program and it is in the funds um, of Horizon 2020 and so on. And I, I would say this is a good ask. Um, and I would say even also, um, you know, in the context of, for example, the work on the code of conduct, it should be possible um, that the commission once organizes a meeting um, which has the purpose to inform about the state of technology in terms of content recognition systems, namely technology which civil society could avail itself of um, to do this job of, um, of a flagger. Yeah, because obviously, as you say, the big problem for you also is the mass. It's not only a problem for the companies. And since we can't trust the companies to tell us the truth here, and even if they would be telling us the truth, we need independent verification of the state of technology. And so I will certainly take back also your idea that this is something to invest in. And I think it would be good if, um, if we get together a meeting and if we identify those who know about the technology, academia and also you know, technology developers, startups, companies who provide this maybe in the future as a service, so um, that we can see uh, whether you know, they are ready to work with civil society and maybe this could be a fruitful relationship between uh, you know, civil society organizations like yours and the tech sector uh, to empower you in your uh, job uh, uh, you know, to tell the platforms, look what you have here. You know, don't you see it yourself? But they do see it themselves, they just don't care. Unfortunately. Well, I, I well, like but that. But by the notifying it to them, they must care. They must care. Why? They care about you have making notified it. Uh, $138 million a day. Yeah, but once you have notified it to them, then they must care. And to empower your ability to notify in a more efficient and faster way uh, through technology, I think it's a legitimate ask. And I would even say, it is actually very legitimate to ask for public money for that purpose. I mean, you know, we're spending a lot of research money on other purposes, but this purpose is urgent. As, and, 
And you can see from the proposal on the DSA that the Commission is also of the opinion that this, this whole issue is urgent. So to spend some money alongside the DSA to empower civil society to fulfill its function, which is foreseen in the DSA, and to prepare it to be able to do it, I think that's a legitimate ask. Thank you. And it was certainly one of our asks in the policy recommendations we forwarded in the consultation process. So that definitely resonates. Um, as we're coming towards the later part of our, our discussion, I'd like to touch on one last specific point, and that's the question of small platforms. We briefly touched on it in the beginning, but I think it's a increasingly relevant um, area where we should direct a lot of attention. Um, I think it is reasonable, as the DSA proposes, that, that there are proportional requests. Bigger platforms have more resources to conduct effective oversight, and so it makes sense on one side to have this differentiation between what's expected of big and small platforms. But at the same time, we see most of the hateful and the dangerous content in small and more obscure platforms. So again, do you think that DSA had posed this effectively? What could it be doing more? What should we be doing more in the future? Paul and then Suzette. Are you waiting for me to answer? I have not heard your question. It is about uh, the duties of smaller platforms. Yes, and how to uh, balance the Social fact that... punishment. Yes, how do we balance the fact that small platforms have very few resources with the fact that there is a lot of danger on them? Well, I mean, you know, let's just continue this um, um, idea of the um, technology um, public funds invested, whether by member states or by the EU. This is actually a technology which could not only be used by civil society, it could also be used by uh, smaller platforms. So it could be, uh, you know, serve the same purpose. So I think uh, investing in this technology um, which make possible to better uh, moderate uh, content is is a good one is is a good investment in any case um i would also say that in terms of fining the percentage of turnover is a very fair way of fining because if you are a small company and you have no turnover or low turnover, you get a smaller fine. Uh, in, and if you are a big company, you get a bigger fine. So percentage of turnover uh, makes sense. And um, um, so from that point of view, uh, you know, this is already a rule of proportionality. Now, as regards the specific obligations, um, I think this is um, a, a, a very important question of good political judgment. What needs to be um, reconciled here are basically three things. Uh, uh, on the one hand, we want to be um, living in a world of freedom of speech. So um, we have an interest to have an open uh, uh, um, public sphere. But we want it to be uh, uh, free of hate and incitement to violence. Second objective. And third, of course, we have an economic objective, uh, which is that we want our uh, digital um, uh, industries to thrive. And we have to reconcile all these three. And the Commission has uh, made a, a proposal, you know, according to its best um, knowledge, where um, this um, balance lies. Um, but I'm sure uh, in the Council and in the Parliament there will be debates about this. And um, uh, we'll have to see um, uh, where this goes. I mean, my uh, experience from the Commission in 30 years, I mean, you know, I, I studied in Hamburg where we learned already as students that the whining is the greeting of the businessman. You know, oh, I don't make money, I have no profits, and the taxes are so high, and so that's the usual thing. And uh, in many years in the Commission, decades in the Commission, you know, I've heard it so many times, 
often also not true. Uh, the argument is so easy to be made and so often heard, um, but um, mm, mm, the reality is that many uh, clients today want platforms which are free of hate. And it can also be a business case to be a platform which takes people and clients serious and respects fundamental rights and engages for democracy. You know, I've seen it in, in privacy and data protection, you have the same type of debate. You have people who go around and say, oh, 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 the costs, the costs, the costs, and they miss the business opportunity, which then Apple takes on and becomes the most valued company on the stock exchange with an aggressive data protection. And I would wish that in the debates before us now, the same happens here. It is a business opportunity to show that you are a responsible platform and a responsible startup and that you take fundamental rights, you take that seriously. That can be made a business case and I hope there are some who make this a business case and I hope they make a lot of money with it and they help um, in the debate in parliament and council uh, um, to show that uh, this is, there is no straight on contradiction between the goals of having a good uh, digital startup and business environment on the one hand and on the other hand saying we want a functioning democracy um, we don't want storm, storming of our uh, uh, seats of parliaments um, and let's be clear about this. In the end, business needs a stable democracy too. And this is what we are contributing to here. And so I think we also have to make an effort to get out of this discourse of contradiction between economic goals on the one hand and sustainable democracy, fundamental rights and rule of law on the other hand. Actually, business also needs those. Thank you very much, Paul. And absolutely, it's a... It's a a remark that we often don't get an opportunity to hear on stressing the the potential that there is for for profitability from ethical ethical publishing or business. Um, Suzette, if I can come to you at this point and put the, a similar question to you on the issue of smaller platforms. A lot of the time, as Alina was mentioning and alluding to, users that become radicalised and and get caught up in the you know the rabbit holes of extremist content start on the bigger platforms and then find their way on on smaller online platforms how would you how would you think would be an effective way of, of fighting against this um well i have two examples one of a big platform stormfront you probably know it it was run from america by a former clans member um and they had different sections for different countries and uh, regions and since uh, the law in america allowed that um, some organizations took it on themselves because each platform needs to have they can have their own server but it has to be connected to the internet uh, to get it out in the world uh, Parler was kicked out by Amazon Web Services, so now they have to find another internet connection provider. And with Stormfront, the same happened. Uh, and there's about 14 big interconnectivity providers, they're called, that connect different platforms to the internet. And so they went by them one by one by one. It took many years. And then the platform was off. Stormfront was gone. Now, with Parler, you will see they will find another interconnectivity provider. But those are big guys, and they don't like their image to be harmed. So that's one way. Um, and I think, in particular, small these small platforms are interesting because at a certain point they might become big and then you're too late and often it's a niche market for extremists in one way or another um, 
so there it's also interesting to go after the individual posters or the moderators of such a forum. Uh, we did that with uh, Stormfront for Belgium and the Netherlands. That was one platform. And Dutch Justice Department arrested the moder two moderators. And since then, it was not heard of again. Uh, you have to find smart ways of controlling these things on different levels, either by going after individual users, going after moderators, and just pick them apart one by one. And uh, boo hoo hoo, they don't have many resources. Well, too bad, isn't it? It's doggy dog. Um, but I think the most important thing is, because the vast majority of people aren't extremists, but they egged on by what they see on the internet. And they have a total trust, like it's been on television, so it must be true. The same goes for the internet. It's on internet and the most ludicrous ideas all of a sudden become the truth. Um, so it's, I think it's also very important to address the public at large and try and educate them and find two different sources on a specific topic and see, you know, if that rhymes, if, if the history fits on both sides. That's another problem with, uh, for instance, Facebook. Uh, to keep you engaged, you are in a bubble only meeting people that agree with you. So th then it becomes the truth. All those Trump guys and girls that stormed the Capitol is because they are in the internet in a bubble and they only see opinions that are their own opinion. So actually that should be forbidden. I always hate it with f Facebook. You can only give 25 people f out of your friends that you see on your wall. I want to see everybody that's going on. I don't want them to select what my opinion is. Because then I snooze. Thank you very much, Suzette. Uh, absolutely. There's, you know, as we were even mentioning before we, we started the live discussion between us, the, the need for nuance and a variety of opinions and, and political discourse at the minute is is paramount and your your point is well taken. Um, you know, perhaps uh, we can continue with a look to the future. Um, as we've discussed today, the, the DSA package as a whole represents a, a set of rules hoping to create a safer and more digital, uh, a safer and more open digital space. These rules will be the governing rules, as Paul, me you mentioned at the start, in the EU for years to come. And as we know, the online space is an incredibly fast paced sphere and subject to regular change. Paul, in coming to you at this moment, how do we ensure that the DSA package remains timely and remains up to date in the years to come? What scope, as you've alluded to prior, is, is, uh, is open for civil society involvement within this framing, framing? And as well, I should note at this point that we, that we received a, a question from the audience that, that refers to, to this for, for further engagement on, on topics and how to, on how to effectively deal with the, the topic of harmful yet legal content. Paul, I'll pass over to you. Thank you very much. So um, how do we make sure that law stays relevant when technology and business models develop? The key here is to put in place technology neutral law, which does not use the buzzwords of today's technology because they change uh, as technology changes, but which is written, uh, let's say at a level of uh, generality and abstraction which allows it to be interpreted differently and change its meaning together with changing technology and changing business models. This is what technology neutral law um, is about. And this is also very important not to stifle innovation um, because as you say, uh, the human innovativeness is unlimited and open and uh, the law should not stand uh, in the way of uh, such innovation. And again, this is what technology neutral law um, can um, obtain. And as he, I think here, 
you know, since we are dealing with a subject of technology, it is very important to head on confront, let's say, the new way of engineering view of the world and the technology uh, impact on legal um, and lawmaking discussions. The programmers believe, and this is, you know, where these easy talks come from, oh, you know, the, the, the law has to change as quickly as technology does, and we need to update the law and, and, and so on. They think this because their codes need updates every four weeks. Why? Because the codes are written for stupids. And who are the stupids the codes are written for? The stupids are the machines, the computers. They cannot think for themselves. Therefore, if something doesn't work, you need to update the code. And this is what's happening every four weeks on our telephones. The law is fundamentally different. The law, a good law, um, is written in such a way that the, it is written, first of all, for humans who are not stupid, who can think for themselves. So we need to make positive use of this ability of people to reinterpret the wording of the law as technology and business models uh, move on into the future. And we have to formulate in such a way that such reinterpretation is possible. That means often less words rather than what the coders and the people from the tech environment would say, more words, you know, please more definition and more detail. No, that's wrong. So um, I think in the, in the legislative process, we have to be very careful in order to keep things relevant, not to get pinned down in uh, today's uh, technology. And for that matter, not to get into a thinking mood, which is the thinking mood of the programmer, but we must be in the thinking mood of good lawmaking. And let's just recall the most important and the best laws, which stay in place sometimes for hundreds of years, like the US Constitution, are the most general laws. And it is the job of the judges, in particular later, to concretize these laws and to concretize them in an evolving way, in line with reality, life, business models, and technology evolving. And we must miss withstand the lobby quest for 150% legal certainty today because they stampede in our offices and they say, yeah, but my business model, and of course they don't talk about their business model, let's say our, you know, the, the digital economy requires this and this. No, it doesn't. It certainly doesn't require that every business model which exists today on the market is safeguarded and gets 150% certainty that it con can continue to make money as it does now. This um, attitude of demand on the lawmaking we must reject because this is something impossible to deliver. And that's actually also not the job of the lawmaker. The job here in the DSA is to think about um, the future of democracy as an institutional settlement. This is also very, very important. Let's not just only talk about individual rights here all the time, you know, the, the rights of the business or the rights of the individual whose speech is being taken down and therefore needs to have unlimited possibilities of appeal, dispute settlement in courts, dispute settlement out, out of court. All this is already foreseen in the DSA. But what is more important is that this act has to contribute to the functioning of our public electronic sphere, where we build our political discourse, where we exchange our views, and where we have the discussions which eventually lead to democratic decisions and lawmaking itself. This is the core function of democracy on which we are working here. And this institutional um, is, um, importance and, and this, let's say, collective importance for the democratic society as a whole of the DSA cannot uh, be underestimated. I think this is actually the most important element of this act. And the individual interests pertaining either to a business model or pertaining to this or that uh, individual right, you know, they have to be balanced with this overarching objective to make our public electronic sphere a space for democratic and free and um, um, uh, opinion building again. And um, so um, uh, this is as much as uh, this is, um, let's say, um, um, a function which 
partially is parallel to the press and media law. And then there are, of course, other elements in the DSA which pertain to the marketplace, uh, which pertain to dealing uh, and selling services and goods. That's, a, that's another matter that's also important. But I would say uh, the historic importance, when one day we look back at A, we are now today discussing this law at a turning point of democracy. And democracy is in a pincer movement between populism and technology. And the DSA is one of the actions which can help us to get out of this pincer movement. And this is what we must make happen. I totally agree with you. Thank you, Suzette, as do I. And I have to say, I think that's a perfect note to end on, as unfortunately, we are slowly running out of time. Um, this is ultimately about the democratic sphere. I think that's the, the main takeaway um, of the conversation. It tends to be a very technical conversation, but I think it's really important to ultimately kind of take it back to the values base that it should be stemming from. Um, I'd like to thank you both, Paul and Suzette, for providing us with a lot of food for our thought. Um, as the DSA makes its way through the Parliament and the Council, I hope we can all and many others um, take note of uh, Paul's call to action and uh, this um, idea that we should all be coming together, interacting with platforms, making more concrete proposals and making our voice heard. And a very big thank you to everyone watching our discussion. We hope to see you again soon in upcoming Neighbors programs. Thank you Can so I much. Can I make one that. remark? Yes, please. Okay. The first 15 years of fighting hate on the internet, we used the regular Dutch anti-discrimination law. Because that is the, the basis of fundamental rights. It's in the law, whether it's uh, on the town square or on the internet. So. Yeah. That was my it's bit. an important point, and I think there, there was a comment from um, Gilbert from LICRA in France about the framework decision on xenophobia, which Paul mentioned in the beginning. And so I think mm. it's important to, to note that that is binding and that it dictates that whatever is illegal offline is also illegal online. Whatever is not kosher offline is also not kosher online. So that's a very important concrete point to, to keep in mind as well. So thank you, Suzette, for that remark. Again, thank you both for speaking to us today. And thank you again to everyone watching. Take care. Thank you. See you soon. Future Goodbye. Program.